Hi, it's Mark Bernard here with the Bernard Institute for Cybersecurity Excellence. And uh, welcome. Uh, we're trying a new approach to sharing knowledge on cybersecurity. So we're going to be touching on a number of topics. There's actually probably going to be over a hundred uh, short clips, two to three minutes long. Each one's going to deal with a sp specific uh, topic around cybersecurity. I encourage you to drop us a line. Uh, don't forget to like our videos on YouTube. Uh, and don't forget to tweet about us. You can find us on a number of different social medias and ask questions. If you have questions about uh, what the topic was for that day, please uh, contact me or the team and we'll be happy to help you with. Today's topic uh, we're going to talk about is uh, cybersecurity architecture. We get a lot of questions about this. Uh, so it's something that we want to touch on to help clarify uh, the understanding of what uh, cybersecurity architecture actually uh, includes. So there's a number of different layers in cybersecurity architecture, okay? Uh, we often refer this to as, a, to as a, a defense in depth approach. So the more layers you have, uh, the way the strategy works, uh, the more likely you're gonna be successful in deterring any kind of threat agents from exploiting any vulnerabilities or any exposures within your organization. So the more layers you have, the better. So let's uh, explain uh, 10 of the layers uh, that I like to follow. Um, Layer one here, you can see, is uh, is the edge firewall. So every uh, infrastructure, every system, every network should be two firewalls away from the internet. On the first firewall, we call it the edge firewall, there's a number of different things that happen here. So we have physical security, uh, we have uh, CCTV, if you don't know what that means, it's closed circuit television. Uh, we have key locks and physical barriers, and we also have environmental controls. On the next layer, this is sort of the sandwich between the two firewalls. It's called the DMZ or the Demilitarized Zone. This is where we might install something like a reverse proxy. And uh, some of these uh, appliances, uh, you can read about more on the internet for sure, but some of these are used to deter certain types of attacks. So a reverse proxy, of course, uh, will help to to hide the identity, the true identity of your of your network and the IP addresses that you use within your network, which can uh, certainly deter and slow down any type of attackers. It can also help you uh, defend against any sort of um, DDoS attacks. So uh, any sort of uh, DDoS and DDoS attacks are getting bigger and bigger all the time. You know, we were hearing about uh, Petrobyte, I believe, uh, packet uh, volumes of DDoS attacks, which is pretty huge. Layer three, interior firewall. So this is where we have uh, the network intrusion prevention system. This is a system that monitors uh, the packets to identify any types of threats that come in. If it sees something it doesn't understand uh, in the packets, it will block it and it will flag it for a security analyst to come and take a look. We also have things like NATing. NATing is where we might rearrange the IP addresses of the devices so that we have so the IP address that you see a device uh, using on the internet, for instance, if you were to uh, scan it or check it out, would be different than the one that we use on our internal network. So we protect our IP addresses. And again, this adds a layer to the confusion, uh, the separation from the internet. We also have security zones. So we might have uh, certain types of systems that are more sensitive to others. So we might have a financial system that processes accounts, uh, uh, purchasing and receivables uh, or a data warehouse. Uh, we may also have a security team. Uh, we may have sales and marketing teams. So each of these teams may have special group profiles created for them. And we add another layer of segmentation by creating a security zone. And then we have network access control systems. Not everybody has these, but these are very useful because what you can actually do is you can register the devices that you have authorized. So they're pre-authorized devices that connect to your network and you can recognize them with a, a network access control system. And th what that means is that anybody who tries to plug into your network or connect through a Wi-Fi will be rejected automatically. And then you have uh, VPN. So of course, uh, virtual private networking, you hear a lot about this. This creates a tunnel over the public space, over the internet from one location to another. And uh, we put it back here behind the second firewall so that it can't be hacked. Um, some people might put it out in the DMZ but it's probably not uh, widely uh, recommended. Layer four, switching. MPLS, 
load balancers, DNS, and VLAN. So these are a lot of the uh, more hardcore infrastructure types of devices that help to provide uh, uh, the, the data packets uh, with paths on where to be sent to or, or how data might be transmitted into the organization. Um, and, and load balancers, of course, help to, uh, to uh, keep uh, one network from becoming saturated. Uh, with a lot of traffic so we have a better level of performance which is good because a lot of users complain when they're connecting to the network they can't get access to something it's too slow right um, so load balancers help to uh, divvy up the load of the packets uh, between different servers and then the name the uh, dom domain uh, network services and vlans uh, virtual uh, uh, logical uh, network that allows you to do more segmentation uh, dns provides names connected to IP addresses. And that's, again, for internal use, right? Uh, because we don't share these with the external world. And then layer five, we have access control. So this is where you log in with your user account and password. You might have uh, multi-factor authentication going on here. Um, this is part of the identity and access management system. This is very important, of course, because this is where we pre-authorize people who can log into our network. Uh, this is also where we assign privilege accounts, which is very important. Uh, also, where we assign access to data uh, that uh, maybe the front end office users or the warehouse users use. So the identity and access control system is sitting back here quite a bit now, five layers. So it's a little bit more difficult for someone to attack. And then we have layer six. And in layer six, we have things like anti-malware, endpoint protection, uh, peripheral security, mobile security, Internet of Things security, and we have something called an uh, enterprise intrusion prevention system. So this is really on the inside. Some security people uh, talk about this part of the network as the, the squishy part. Um, hopefully in your network it's not squishy because uh, what that refers to is that it's not very secure. But certainly at layer six, uh, we are behind a number of different layers now that are protecting us from any attacks from the Internet. And uh, this is a, a good point. So, of course, anti-malware and endpoint protection refers to the devices. So devices have gone through authorization to get through the firewalls. They've gone through uh, scanning of the packets. Uh, they're in the right security zones. The device has been authenticated through a NAC. Uh, you might have a VPN service going on. Uh, there's some switching, putting it into the right location within the organization. Um, and then you have access control so you have a number of different things that have already happened before uh, the device can actually connect to the network the endpoint protection makes sure that whatever the device is if it's a tablet or a mobile phone or a, or a laptop that it's protected from anyone trying to maybe stick a usb into it and upload a virus um, or any type of uh, nefarious type of activity like that so we have this back here endpoint protection and peripheral security uh, refers to all the different devices that we have within the network. So we might have multifunction printers, scanners, uh, those types of devices. So that's uh, really important uh, that we protect those devices because obviously they have uh, maintenance access to that specific devices from the manufacturer. So there's potential for a backdoor into the network. So we want to make sure that they have some type of controls around them, physical and logical controls. And layer seven, so we have a DLP, we have the security information and event management system, uh, we have uh, any type of intelligence sharing going on. Uh, data DLP stands for data loss prevention, so this is to make sure that people aren't walking away with data from the organization that doesn't belong to them. Uh, so we have a type of a device that actually monitors for this type of nefarious activity uh, from an insider threat potentially. Uh, and then, of course, the SIEM is the uh, security uh, tool that we use that correlates all the logs that come from all these different devices that are attached to our infrastructure and provides a security team and a security operations center, probably a number of security analysts monitoring uh, the environment. They may be sitting in a room with monitors in it or they may be getting alerts and they're busy doing something else. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that they can uh, um, be alerted, but the scene correlates, and that's the key part, right? Is so it, it looks at all the different uh, potential uh, activity that's going on in the network, 
and it has some uh, rationale or some algorithms. There may be some customization going on depending on the industry that you're in. And it uh, provides you with uh, an alerting mechanism. So when you see something happening, uh, then you can respond to it or investigate it and see if there's a problem. And then, of course, intelligence sharing is all about, as we learn things about uh, cybersecurity incidents and events, we want to share that knowledge with other people in our industries who are, uh, you know, cleared to receive that information so that they can use it and hopefully uh, build uh, their security uh, networks um, uh, better and firm them up, harden them, as we like to say, uh, and be prepared for any type of attacks that are coming. So this is something that a number of organizations are doing. If you've uh, attended my uh, NIST cybersecurity program, then uh, you know uh, that what who those organizations are. So uh, please feel free to sign up. Layer eight, uh, cybersecurity management system. So this is a, a, a management system. It's not an analytical tool. It's a number of processes such as governance and risk management, continual improvement, internal audit, uh, awareness training, strategic communications and records and document administration for the purpose of collecting evidence about the performance of the management system. So the security management system is usually based on something like ISO 27001, which was originally developed by the UK government, or the NIST cybersecurity framework, which was developed by the US government. And then there's a number of other things that we do. So the integration points into the information technology group of people uh, usually relies on the use of ITIL. So that's IT, ITIL is an information library, uh, contains a number of processes. I believe there's like 13 processes in it, things like change management, vulnerability management, problem management. So these are all well documented and they're well integrated with all the other processes. So when you adopt ITIL, you know that you have a good framework to manage your IT group with, and it's easier for you to integrate your cybersecurity program with. Privacy impact assessments, of course, you've heard of uh, GDPR and all the other PIPEDA, all the other privacy uh, legislations, uh, the California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, they all require privacy impact assessments. And this is a, an assessment, it's like similar to a risk assessment, but different because privacy impact assessment looks at, are we complying with the law and how are we complying with it? And then we document that. Whereas a risk assessment looks at the asset, determines what the vulnerabilities are and whether or not it can be exploited and then identifies a risk with a risk calculation. And then we have many other standards. So I'm only uh, mentioning a few here. The STRA is the risk assessment. It's called a security threat risk assessment in the government world. Uh, the rest of us might just call it an RA or a TRA. Um, then there's SOC. So there's a number of pieces of legislation that also protect information. So SOC is really based, it's a two-part process. It's really based about an attestation of how your control framework is working in your organization, uh, which we will get into in another uh, video coming down the pipe. Like I said, I'm going to be making approximately about a um, hundred or more videos like this one very short because a lot of my lessons, as you know, if you've attended my lessons or lectures, they tend to run on for two hours or more. And that's a long time for some people to sit down and, and listen to everything that's going on. So um, we appreciate that. We appreciate you don't have much time. So we're going to try and make uh, these videos, the next 100 videos uh, within 15 minutes or less so that you can just listen for a few minutes and then you can get the gist of what's going on. And if you have questions, ask us. So again, back to SOC 2, so it has two parts. So there's an attestation part uh, where somebody, an external party, uh, reviews the controls around the information handling. This is specifically around financial data. So it's around your, uh, your uh, general ledger um, <coughs> or your finance system. You might have Oracle Business Suite. There's a number of different tools you might be using out there. Pardon me. And then there's another part around the controls around the actual financial system. So, <clears throat> so for instance, if you're writing checks, what's the procedure to write a check? If you're reconciling uh, accounts, if you have suspense accounts, or if you have other specific accounts uh, that involved um, purchasing or receiving, there's a number of different things that you might look at within the financial world that need to have protection around that information. So it's very specific to that. But there are many, many other pieces of legislation uh, that cross over. If you've looked at my uh, presentation on uh, general data uh, protection uh, regulation, you'll see I've listed a number of um, privacy related, uh, cybersecurity related and, and others that have been around for a number of years. Okay, layer nine. Cloud computing. There's a lot of talk about cloud computing not being very helpful. 
um, and maybe exposing us to more uh, threats. But actually, if it's managed properly, cloud computing can actually add another layer. And why I say that is because if you have a physical data center, um, it's easier to target. Uh, whereas if you have a cloud, then uh, you have some resilience built in. So clouds, of course, are, are not one single data center, but there are many, there are a cluster of data centers. And a lot of times they replicate data over different regions uh, within a country or maybe different countries within the globe. Some of the cloud projects I've worked on, they have six or seven uh, massive uh, data centers in different parts of the world. They might have them in South America or Europe. They might have in Canada or the US or Asia. They, they may be all over the place. And, uh, and why this adds a layer of control within the cybersecurity framework is because if you're attacked um, and a site goes down, you can easily fail over to the next site, right? And your business doesn't get interrupted. So it does add some resilience to your, uh, your cybersecurity program. So that's layer nine. And of course, uh, layer 10 is if everything else fails, <laughs> then you have some kind of a service continuity process. You have succession planning to make sure that the right people, so if somebody can't make it into work or they get ill with like a coronavirus or some other type, uh, and they're an important person, then you've already been working on the knowledge transfer between them and somebody else. So you, if you, they're really important, you probably have one or two or three people uh, lined up to take over that job someday. Uh, but they're all sharing information back and forth. So if one person goes down, then the next person can come in and fill in. So that's, you know, succession planning is very important. Service continuity is about keeping the system running. So that's also very important. Um, and then, of course, there's the traditional uh, business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning. All right. So I mentioned the management system, and I talked about the different uh, processes within that, governance, risk management, uh, program management, strategic communication, knowledge management, security architecture, monitoring, and integration. And this is, actually, this is based on my mind map. Uh, some people have been following me. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so there is some people out there who want me to build a course around my mind map. And I'm starting to do that by with these little informational pieces. So I'm trying to keep these presentations short. And I know that I'm running on here a little bit. So it's my first attempt at this. So I will refine the process as I go forward. But this is an important topic. Security architecture is very, very important. Okay, so if you want to contact me and you want to follow me, please, uh, we have a company website. I have a profile on LinkedIn and a company website there. Also on Facebook, I have a company website. Uh, I have a YouTube channel and I also have a Twitter can uh, channel. I have a number of social media connections so you can follow. Please make sure that you hit the like button and, uh, and that, uh, so that we, we can, uh, you know, get uh, more, uh, I guess, distribution, better distribution uh, to people. Uh, you can also uh, check us out on our website. So www.bernardinstitute.com or you can email me at markbernard at uh, bernardinstitute.com or you can call me. Uh, if you want a direct approach, okay? I'm um, looking forward to the next um, month or two and getting all these little videos out. And I hope that you find this useful. And if you do, please uh, provide comments uh, on the website uh, in the comments section. Uh, provide me with some feedback so I know how, how it's going, to, if, if this is better for you or if you would like to have uh, a different approach, okay? Thank you and have a great day and peace.